3 p.m. live from our studio in New York City. I'm Julie Hyman alongside Josh Lipton. This is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. Markets looking to build on the strong gains for the month. November on track to be the best month for stocks so far this year. And we're also seeing bond yields extend their slide on the back of strong economic data this morning. The 10-year yield breaking below 4.3%, its lowest level since September. We'll take a closer look at investment opportunities in this environment as we head into 2024. And a possible mega merger in the healthcare space ensures Cigna and Humana reportedly in talks to combine, that's according to the Wall Street Journal. Now, if that deal happens, the new company would rival United Healthcare and CVS Health in the space, what it means for investors and consumers ahead. Plus, General Motors shareholders getting an early Christmas present. The stock soaring after the automaker reinstated its annual guidance, issued a buyback, and raised its dividend. We'll get analysts' reaction to that news later this hour. Let's get you up to speed on the market action. And once again today, we are seeing, um, because of the dip in bond yields, some strength in some of the interest rate sensitive groups. Right now, if you take a look at the three major averages, we're not seeing much movement. But what movement we are seeing is slightly to the upside here. The Dow gaining about 83 points. That's about a quarter of 1%. The S&P 500 up about a tenth of 1%. And the Nasdaq, well, the Nasdaq is hardly budging there. It's up about 7.7 .7 points here. But again, uh, we are seeing the interest rate sensitive groups higher. Real estate is the leading sector right now. Financials are also gaining, although they sometimes go up with higher rates. So, you know, it sort of uh, depends on the day, I guess. Communication services, the worst performing group today, Josh. All right, let's also, you know, let's talk about treasuries as well, which let's you mentioned, it. Julie, because that rally continues. We know, of course, it has been, listen, a strong November rally there. If you look at the yield on the 10-year, we are now at 4271. Of course, we saw the intraday peak over 5%. Bloomberg, by the way, pointing out that this gauge of global sovereign and corporate debt has now returned about 5% this month. That means it's heading for its best performance since December 2008. Right. Um, investors, we know, of course, speculating the Fed is done here. They're on hold. We did hear from some more of our policymakers, our central bankers today. They were talking more about where they think inflation is heading. Some different opinions there. Atlanta Fed President Rafael Bostic said he's getting, it seems like, more confident that inflation is firmly on the downward path, moving in the right direction. On the other hand, Thomas Barkin telling reporters the central bank should keep the option to hike. So maybe some divergent opinions there. Yeah, and then Loretta Mester weighing in also saying that policy is in a good place to assess incoming data. And speaking of incoming data, we got some today, right? We got GDP uh, for last quarter uh, rising at a 5.2% annualized pace. That was an upward revision. Consumer spending at 3.6%. That was a little bit of a lower revision. But nonetheless, uh, when we look at the Treasury, the 10-year yield at least, and just a remarkable journey that it has been on in the past two months, as we mentioned in the open, the yield getting back to the level where it was in mid to late September, but really the fact that we saw it climb so high and that there was a lot of consternation in the equity market as a result of those higher yields, and then it's just really reversed in relatively short order as we have seen some changing perceptions of what's going to happen with the yields. One of the other things, of course, that caught our eye is Bill Ackman in an interview sure. with David Rubenstein saying that he expects the Federal Reserve to have to cut early next year, right. which is earlier than the market certainly is pricing sure. in, because he thinks economic fun fundamentals are going to deteriorate. That's been a wrong call all year from people who thought that way. We'll see. What well, we, when you have a billionaire investor, Bill Ackman, make a call like that, it does get a lot of attention to headlines. And certainly, look, and, you know, we've been talking to a lot of smart investment strategists. That call for early is something I don't think we've heard too much of. So he's, no. he's outside the norm there we for have sure. not. Yes. Well, as we talked about, the U.S. economy grew at an even faster pace than expected in the third quarter, reflecting rising trends in investment and government spending. GDP rising 5.2 percent at an annualized pace. That's the fastest in nearly two years. And it comes as Morgan Stanley has released its global outlook for 2024 and 2025 on the global economy. One of the authors there, Seth Carpenter, is joining us now, Chief Global Economist at Morgan Stanley. Good to see you, Seth. Thanks for being here. Um, it's so interesting the moment we're in right now, after the year that we have had, right, where economic growth defied all predictions. And now heading into 2024, 
How are we feeling? <laughs> it's funny you said that it's interesting. By interesting, you mean <laughs> aggravating, confusing, <laughs> wrong footing. Uh, you know, we're feeling pretty good. You mentioned the, the GDP print. <clears throat> it was a very strong quarter. I think we knew that. The revision sort of only told us what we knew before. Big number for the quarter, but the strength, some of the business investment and structures, not in equipment. Consumer spending actually a little bit softer. Inve uh, inventory numbers were pretty strong contributing to that number. All of that makes us go, okay, our read initially was that we can look through that strength. We see the economy slowing. We still think the economy will slow next year. But we've been in the camp for a long time that the Fed is going to be able to get inflation down without causing an outright recession. So more slowing to go on. Inflation continuing to coming down. And there, I think I agree with uh, Rafael Bostic, who you mentioned. I think the collective Fed forecast for how fast inflation is coming down, too pessimistic. It'll come down faster. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for the Fed to take their first tentative rate cut in June of next year on the back of continuing uh, falling inflation and some more softening of the real economy. And when you say says slowing next year is what you're looking for, quantify that for us. So call it something like one and a half percent, right? So slower than what you'd like to see, almost surely slower than the, the long run potential output of the economy but not a disaster, and I think that's the real difference. If we go back six months, a year ago, a year and a half ago, the debate was hard landing versus soft landing. We stuck our necks out back in February of 2022, and we said soft landing, no recession, and that was not the most popular view of all time. And here we are, we're feeling pretty good about it. We think there is still some more slowing to go, but we think we are not going to have a recession. At the same time, as you wrote in this outlook, there's still a long road ahead when it comes to inflation coming back to normal, right? Whatever normal means. I guess, are we talking 2% sort of Absolutely. globally? I, mean, here? I, I personally take Jay Powell at his word that they are committed to their 2% inflation target. They also, you know, have that new framework where there may be during an expansion a little bit above two, so two one, but we don't think we're in a new world where inflation is three percent or four percent forever. It's coming down. We think it probably gets to inflation in the U.S. core inflation two four at the end of next year and two one at the end of twenty five. So really, pretty good progress towards their target. But it is going to take a while, and that's true not just for the U.S. but globally as well for inflation to come back down to a more normal level and for rates to come back down to a more normal level Absolutely. from from start to finish, I guess. No, I, I, th I think no question there. And I have to say one thing that is just different, if you look at the decade before COVID, the US, Europe, you know, the developed market economies were sort of mired in this low interest rate, low inflation world. I think that sort of truly sort of muddling world is probably over where the, the central banks are going to get back to their, their inflation target. I mean, I think it was remarkable that just three or four years ago, their biggest concern was that inflation was too low. Now it's too high, but it'll come back, but it will, won't go back to those lows that they worried about. I think that's true in the US. I think that's true in the Euro area. I think perhaps the untold story so far, though, that I think lots of investors need to pay a lot more attention to is Japan. Over two decades, really boring, really mired in sort of zero nominal growth. Those days are behind us. We think there is a fundamental structural shift there in Japan. Inflation has got up. Some of it imported, some of it imported from commodities, so that part's not sustainable. But there is a real change in the underlying dynamic of inflation in Japan. You can see it in the wage negotiations. You can see it in what's going on with uh, producer prices. Uh, we think Japan really has turned the corner and has closed the door on those sort of lost decades of no growth. So that's, it's an interesting take, Seth, on Japan. Also want to get your take on China, though. You know, there was, there was a lot of hope that there would be this sort of post-COVID boom over there and said it's kind of shaky. What, what's your outlook for China next year? And I'm also interested, you know, do you think authorities have taken the right steps there or are there other levers they should have been pulling? So it's challenging. If we were having this conversation one year ago, we would have been among those people who you said were kind of optimistic and looking for the post-COVID boom. And we got it in the first quarter and then it fizzled. <clears throat> There is the very clear risk of a debt deflation cycle, sort of what Japan had had back in the, uh, in the 90s. A uh, lot of debt. We've seen inflation coming down, going negative. Uh, lack of confidence with businesses and households. And so what is it going to take? Uh, it probably will take more stimulative fiscal policy to get them out of there. The PBOC has taken a few steps to ease rates, to add some liquidity. That's not where the problem is. The problem is willingness and enthusiasm to spend, and it probably will take some, some action. Uh, have the authorities done the right thing? Uh, I don't think we've seen enough yet. We think there still needs to be more in the way of fiscal policy. 
they have lots of goals about energy transition, green energy infrastructure spending, and I think that kind of additional spending could give them enough of a boost to get a bit of a cyclical reflation, but we really are at a crossroads now, and it's going to be decision-making coming out of Beijing that's determinative. And then what effect does that have on the rest of the globe? Do you see China exporting deflation, for example, and that's one of the things that helps bring inflation down, but does it end up being negative in the long term. <laughs> so I think there probably is a little bit of that. We've seen a little bit of weakness um, from the currency. Uh, I, and, uh, you know, oil prices have been moving back and forth in different ways, but there's, um, you know, I don't think that's going to be the primary channel. So maybe a little bit of exporting of, of deflation. But remember, right now, we've got central banks tightening policy, trying to pull things down, and the amount of spillover from China in inflation is probably going to get lost there. Where I would point to, though, is Europe and Germany in particular. German manufacturing is really in a tough spot. Their energy prices are going all over the, you know, very volatile and higher than they have been. And they have for a long time relied on exports to China to keep that sector afloat. And that's just not there. So I think that's probably one of the bigger spillovers. And Seth, I want to get you out of here on this as a subject, you know, we talk a lot about here. Our viewers care a lot about the U.S. housing market. Where are we now, Seth? What do you see in 2024? <laughs> Um, we are sort of in this, the housing market is in a really funny place. So if you look at housing activity measured by total home sales, still depressed. If you look at housing affordability, one of the worst places we've been literally since the data have been collected. Um, but part of what's going on is anybody who is in their home right now and owns it probably has a mortgage rate that is so good they don't want to move unless they absolutely have to. And so it's a really thin market. New home sales is a share of total home sales, really high, because it's the only game in town. So what happens from here? Well, you know, we do think the Fed's going to start easing rates come June. Uh, the tenures come down, as you all were talking about at the beginning, and that's going to make things a little bit uh, better for mortgages. Uh, but mostly it's going to be a muddle through. And so we see home prices coming off a little bit, but single digits down from, uh, you know, on a 12-month change basis, that's not that much compared to where things were two years ago, where it's been a massive appreciation. So we're mostly in this very tepid, muddle through period for the U.S. housing sector. You're not going to get a ton there until interest rates come down a lot more. Uh, but it's also not going to collapse. Our, our housing uh, team in particular has been pretty adamant that the, the, the weak supply along with the reduced demand are sort of pushing against each other, but you're not going to get a big move in either direction. All right, Seth, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolutely. That was great. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And moving on here, a big story in the healthcare space today. Cigna and Humana in talks to merge. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. Companies reportedly could finalize the deal by the end of the year. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kamlani has the details for us. Anjali. That's right, Josh. And that is pretty much as much as we know right now. The Wall Street Journal saying that, of course, this deal that could uh, close by the end of the year or take place by the end of the year would be a stock and cash option and uh, really would combine two huge insurers. Humana, well known for its Medicare Advantage plans and its focus on senior care. Meanwhile, Cigna, large with the commercial space. So that would put two uh, really big companies side by side into each other's uh, space. We do know that in the past, the two have pursued a merger back in 2015, 2016. That never came to fruition. But this is an interesting play considering the fact that we haven't seen such a large mega deal uh, like this in quite some time. Uh, this would definitely give Cigna, if it is the acquirer, uh, a platform about the size of what CVS and United Healthcare have, those two which have engaged in mergers in recent years, CVS, of course, notably acquired Aetna. And so this gives them that level of play when it comes to covered lives, when it comes to market share, and also bronzes out to the provider side with Humana. So really interesting report there. Definitely an interesting report. And in creating that report, creating an interesting ripple effect as well, Andre, we noticed, you know, Cigna shares, we should mention, first of all, are trading down. But a lot of the other health insurance companies today are also trading down. So talk to us, talk us through that. What might be going on there and what a deal like this would do, not just for those two companies, but for the bigger competitive landscape? Yeah, so we know that, of course, a lot of the independent or sort of standalone insurers have decreased over time, like I mentioned with the CVS Aetna merger, but they really are only a handful of companies that do exist without sort of vertical integration, which is what we would see in this case. Um, and, of course, there's, you know, the players like Molina and Elevance. 
um, and Centene, really big in the Medicare Advantage or government payer space. But as you can see on your screen, Humana has a really large portion of that Medicare Advantage space. Cigna, not so much. They've actually uh, struggled with their Medicare Advantage segment and have looked to offload it, according to reports recently. So this really opens up that window. Also, Humana's uh, chief executive will be retiring by the end of the year and has announced a replacement. So this could all fit really nicely with just how the companies are functioning. Uh, but to the point that you made, it really reduces the competitiveness in the landscape of health insurance broadly if this goes through. And Angela, I'm just curious too, like let's say the deal does go through, what kind of regulatory uh, interest or attention you, you think that could draw? Would this, would this get the attention of regulators? It, it's definitely interesting to see. We know that the FTC is big on blocking some of these mega mergers and, and definitely looking at them and scrutinizing them right now. Uh, what I find interesting is, as I mentioned, sort of the different parts that Humana and Cigna could bring together for their uh, respective focuses. Uh, we've seen in the past big deals sort of get blocked back when the two were in discussions before. It was a result of a fallout of Aetna, Humana, and Anthem at the time in Cigna talking about mergers. When that got blocked by judges, then these two started conversations, which eventually fell apart. But it would be interesting to see if, based on their sort of separate focuses, does this deal come through and give Cigna that sort of full vertical integration, including Express Scripts, their PBM, including uh, you know pharma pharmacy benefits, and then the provider side, from Humana, does that give them the whole picture to give them that platform or does it fall through because of the current landscape and just sort of a lot of focus from the FTC is really waiting to see if that, what happens. All right, we're, we're gonna be watching Anjali Kamlani. Thank you so much, Anjali. Let's get to some trending tickers now. Shares of Foot Locker surging today. Check that out, up, up over 15%. That's after posting better than expected earnings results. So this one, Julie, Foot Locker reports, lifts its full year guidance. So what are they looking for? Well, they're looking for a full year comparable sales decline of eight and a half to 9%. And that was less bad than what they estimated previously. Comparable sale, store sales, by the way, dropped about 8% for the quarter ended October 28th. And that was better than analysts had figured. And I, I did think some interesting commentary from execs as well here, just talking about the consumer saying customers remain discerning with their discretionary dollars. So just sort of echoing that same theme we've heard from a number of retailers at this point about how they feel the consumer is doing in terms of that caution for quarters ahead. Yeah, it's always interesting to me when these things come out less worse. I mean, we just talked to an analyst last week That's right. who was very negative yep. on the shares, and certainly there was a lot of pessimism going into this report. That's reflected in the analyst commentary coming out of it. There's been a lot of um, sort of back and forth about what inventory Foot Locker was getting. That's what we heard from that analyst. Were they getting the freshest stuff? Were they getting enough inventory that they could sell through? Um, and Mary Dillon, the CEO, did say this was a reset year, right? So... You know, it looks like maybe analysts and, and investors are looking to that at this point, but then at some point, you know, you have to not be negative when it comes to comparable sales. Right. So we'll see how long this kind of uh, rally can last in these shares. Yeah, we, we should know. Listen, it, the shares are surging today for sure, up over 15%. But this stock was plenty beat up heading yeah. to this print. I mean, it was down about 40% heading into the report. Exactly. And even, even with the surge today, you are still deep in the red year today. Yeah, there is a little bit of chatter that the company did well during, you know, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, et cetera, that it did get some traffic. So, yeah. well, next earnings report, I guess we'll have to wait to right, hear wait more see. about that. And last up here, activist investor Elliott Management taking up a $1 billion stake in energy company Philips 66. Shares of Philips 66 rising on that news, up over 4% right now. So uh, activist investor Elliott Management, we're talking about them again, Julie. Yeah. It's been a heavy We've week. We've been talking a about A heavy week of lately. Elliott and Paul Singer. Yeah. On the move again. So $1 billion stake in Philips 66. This is, the, of course, the oil refiner based in Texas, Houston, uh, looking for uh, board seats. Stock was up uh, up about 13 percent before this news hit. But Elliott wants what, of course, activists always want. They want better execution, better performance. And they think they know how to get that done and send the stock much, much higher. What's interesting to me here is this is a friendly 
In other right. words, they didn't call um, for the CEO's head. Correct. Elliott Management is saying we think <laughs> that that management can actually get this done. They deserve investor support, is what he they said in their letter. As long as they demonstrate meaningful progress against these targets, and then. Uh, Mark Lashier, the CEO, for his part, said, we've engaged in discussions with Elliott. We welcome their perspective. So compared to some of the other Elliott um, campaigns, this one does seem a little bit more amicable. Yep. And indeed, the Phillips shares have not collapsed this year. They're up, in fact, about 13 percent. So, you know, it, it looks like that this is a more um, mild yeah, interaction. And at least some of the, uh, you know, some of the commentary in the street was pretty supportive. I mean, I'm looking at J.P. Morgan. They were telling their clients off this that Elliott's involvement should likely be a positive for the name as an extra push towards the goals the company already laid out. So they, they remain overweight targets 134. Yeah. All right. Well, we're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, tomorrow marks one year since the launch of ChatGPT. What is next in the race to dominate the AI space? We'll dig into the sector. Also, we got some earnings after the bell. We'll bring you Salesforce's third quarter results and in-depth analysis. And remembering legendary investor Charlie Munger. We'll speak to the CEO of Berkshire-owned Brooks Runnings in just a moment. We're remembering Charlie Munger here on Yahoo Finance. Berkshire Hathaway and Brooks Running have had an intimate relationship for almost 20 years. In 2006, Brooks Running was purchased by Fruit of the Loom. Its parent company, Berkshire Hathaway, was where Charlie Munger, of course, served as vice chair for 45 years. Here for more on Charlie Munger's life and legacy, Brooks Running CEO Jim Weber is joining us. Always a pleasure to see you, Jim, and we appreciate you spending some time with us today. First, I, I would just ask you from, for some impressions uh, of Charlie Munger. And speaking of impressions, as I think I've told you before, when I happened to order a pair of Brooks running shoes back during the pandemic in 2020, to my surprise, I didn't realize this in advance, they had arrived with a picture of Charlie and a picture of Warren Buffett on the inside of the shoes. I had, I had uh, unknowingly purchased the Berkshire collectors uh, 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 versions of those Brooks shoes. Fantastic. Yeah, you got the signature uh, autographed Warren and Charlie shoes. So, you know, we formally became part of Berkshire in uh, 2012. 
And I've never been associated with a company quite like Berkshire. It's so unique. And so I went to work on trying to understand the culture and what the expectations were for our business. And I came across a white paper that Charlie uh, was in the middle of on corporate governance. And he talked about this, this creating this web of d deserved trust instead of a rules-based culture, just having the right people and, and creating a trust relationship so all of your energy could go against the customer and the business. And that is the foundation. So I went to school on, on Charlie Munger in the early days uh, and trying to understand Berkshire. I think Warren has referred to him often as the architect of Berkshire Hathaway when Warren is the general contractor. And, and wow, I think we've seen his influence every day. And Jim, I'm just curious, you know, so obviously Brooks has been a subsidiary of Berkshire for a long time. Part of that Berkshire family being around, you know, legendary investors, truly like, like Buffett and Mr. Munger. I'm just, for Brooks as a company, Jim, what's been sort of the benefits, the advantages of that? You know, I, I think it's such a cliche to say we're playing a long-term game and we're focused that way. I'll tell you a little story. In 2015 and 16, we stalled. Our marketplace was stalled. Our, our revenue was going backwards and our profits were at a 10 year low. And we were reconfiguring our strategy around premium performance products and reinventing performance. And I had the opportunity to meet Charlie down at his home in LA for a 90 minute lunch. And I, you know, we were right on the cusp of launching this strategy. It was an evolution of where we've been. And no one knew whether or not it would work, but he, his advice was, was really clear. He said, there's always room for a premium performance niche brand, and that's what you guys are. And he told me a story, that this was so memorable, of a shoe store in Omaha decades ago, I assume, that was actually x-raying feet to help suggest the right shoe. And, and, and over time, they figured out too much radiation is a bad thing, so they stopped x-raying feet. But his point was that people had a relationship with, with their feet and shoes. And so the future at, at, uh, for Brooks was bright. And, and he was absolutely right. We've more than done, we've had so much success the last um, few years. But in 2017, it wasn't clear. And um, what, 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 you know, that's the kind of support that we felt for playing the long game and building brand. Um, that is, I love that. That is a, a great story. What um, kind of communication, I mean, obviously Warren Buffett is still very much at Berkshire Hathaway, but I'm also curious what kind of conversations you have with the other folks in management there who, are, of course, or ha have already been tapped to succeed uh, Buffett and Munger, um, Greg Abel and the rest of the team over mm -hmm. there. Um, what kind of communication do you have with them and what do they bring to the Brooks running table? You know, it, it, again, it goes to the uniqueness of Berkshire. There are so many, so many companies, and we're all accountable to be chief strategy officers, risk officers, chief compliance officers. So we don't have a lot of interaction across the companies. Um, it, for me, it was Warren for many, many years, and now it's Greg Abel, and we take Greg through our strategy, through our business plans, and and he he'll never not take a call if we need him. He's always there. But you know the expectation is that we're focused on our business, and of course we love that. So that's what we're doing. There's not a lot of interaction. You know, there's no extra people at Berkshire. I, I want to say the corporate staff now numbers something like 24 or 25 people. Um, so you know, we we operate Brooks like we own it, and it's a wonderful advantage for us, I think, and as we compete in our category. And Jim, I'll get you out of here on this. I just would love to hear more about how business is doing at Brooks right now. You know, we've heard from. A lot of retailers, obviously, Jim, this earnings season. I don't hear them talking about recession, Jim, but I certainly hear this theme of, of a more more caution about the consumer right now and the outlook. So just curious how business is going at Brooks, what demand is like right now. Yeah, I'm at an industry conference right now, so I'm going to get an earful in the next three days. But here's what we're seeing. I think our category is 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 in the win column. We're we're doing very very well as a category. We had a record Q3. We're having a really strong Q4. Um, Cyber 10 now we're calling it was was absolutely at expectations. And next year we're planning double digit growth. And and there's still a lot of uncertainty around that. But our consumer and our category and our our runner is is pretty healthy. Definitely seeing slowdown in Europe. You know, I think there's a lot of tentativeness at retail and and in the consumer marketplace over in Europe. But in the United States, um, you know, it, I think demand right now remains really strong for our products. All right, Jim. Thank you so much for joining us today for those stories. You know, you shared, Jim. We appreciate it. I know our viewers do too.
Thank you. Appreciate it. And coming up, a mixed picture from the Fed. One official saying the rate hike cycle is at an end. Another says not so fast. We're going to bring you the latest commentary on interest rates. That's after the break. We've been hearing more Fed speak today, this time from Atlanta's Rafael Bostic, indicating the Fed could be done raising rates and saying he expects inflation to continue to fall. But it seems Cleveland's Loretta Master thinks differently, keeping another hike on the table. So it's a mixed picture. Jennifer Schonberger, of course, has been following all of this. So give us the details, Jen. Hi, Julie. That's right. Conflicting views within the Federal Reserve persisting on whether interest rates need to move higher. This, of course, as Wall Street continuing to bet that the Fed is finished raising rates. Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester suggested today in a speech that interest rates are at appropriate levels right now, but kept rate hikes on the table if the economy remains too hot. Mester saying in a speech, quote, monetary policy is in a good place for policymakers to assess incoming information on the economy and financial conditions. She went on to say, Say whether the Fed funds rate needs to go higher than its current level and for how long policy needs to remain restrictive will depend importantly on whether the economy is evolving as expected. Her comments contrasting with Atlanta Fed President Raphael Bostic, who said today that he's gained more confidence that inflation will continue to drop over the next year, implying he continues to believe the Fed could be done raising rates if his prediction holds. His rationale? 
there's still bite left from the Fed's aggressive rate-raising campaign that could slow the economy and push inflation lower. Bostic writing in an essay, quote, I simply don't think that that kind of blockbuster expansion is durable given the current restrictive stance of monetary policy in combination with tight financial conditions. I don't think we've seen the full effects of restrictive policy. And buttressing Bostick's outlook just this afternoon, fresh anecdotal evidence from the Federal Reserve's Beige Book showing that the economy weakened in the month of November from October, with six districts showing a slowdown. As well, for the next six to 12 months, the economy expected to weaken, consumers becoming more price sensitive, and demand for labor easing as well. Back to you. Jennifer Schonberger, thank you so much. And tomorrow marks one year since the launch of OpenAI's ChatGBT and the start of a nationwide frenzy around artificial intelligence. One big name in all that buzz is, of course, chipmaker NVIDIA. Shares are up more than 220% this year. And CEO Jensen Wong, speaking at the 2023 DealBook Summit today, said he is not worried about rising competition in the AI space, saying NVIDIA has a decade head start. For more on the AI sector and how to invest, we turn to Sylvia Jablonski, CEO and CIO of Defiance ETF. So Sylvia, thank you so much for joining us. Exactly. And maybe, Sylvia, just start there with NVIDIA. So, I mean, you have this boom of interest in AI. Um, clearly, you know, Jensen Wong and NVIDIA, the face of it, investors have piled in. We're up 203% now this year. When you think of the smart, places to commit capital if you want to play that AI theme, Sylvia. Is NVIDIA still still on there despite that move? NVIDIA is very much at the top of my list. I think there are different ways to get exposure to it. You can use ETFs so you're not paying, you know, kind of the sticker price if you want the basket. But in terms of single stocks, it's still my top pick. And I think, you know, you mentioned in your, in your intro, I don't think Jensen Wong is worried about anything because he owns 90% of the market. So even if they come to get him, you know, they're coming to get another 1% or 2%. So, mm. you know, they own 90% of the GPU market. You have a trillion dollars in data center upgrades that are poised to come forward. AI is poised to grow 37% in the next decade, you know, there's just massive opportunity here and they came out of the gates so fast and, and I just think it's going to be hard to catch up. That being said, you need other alternatives, right? So AMD is a player. They sit in the different Tesla vehicles that come out. Um, they're in Xboxes. They're in gaming. You know, those sectors are picking up and they own the other 10% of the GPU market. So, you know, there are certainly winners and, and I think that there's room to grow in this space for sure. And it's interesting because you, what you do, you put together ETFs that look at some of these emerging technologies, right? So how do you figure out what they're going to be and what the best players are? So for example, okay, AI, we all know about AI at this point. Mm -hmm. Like what's the other thing that we don't know about that hasn't gotten all the hype that maybe we could, there's more, some value in right now? Yeah, and that's that's actually such a great point because I think if you kind of you know go back a year or two, the the biggest word was was five G and it was communications and connectivity, and that was going to be the future of AI, that lower latency would power AI. But it's you know so it's partially that it's partially actual artificial intelligence, what goes into that? Data processing, data storage, uh, machine learning, quantum computing, supercomputing. Um, you know, essentially changing the way that. Every sector you can think of operates the way that doctors get information and share information, the way that you know defense can have more precise targets and things like that. So it's it's kind of everything. We we looked at that and thought, okay, there's AI, but what's behind it? You have to have supercomputers, you have to have quantum computing, you have to have speed, lower latency, 5G, and then we try to create these themes that are investable. So you know the names in these products are companies like Nvidia, and they're also companies like IBM and Hewlett Packard that we kind of forget about, but they're actually leaders in supercomputing. And so I know another theme that you, you talk about is diversification, income, just as a way to add sort of, um, I guess, protection to the portfolio, right? Just talk about that theme and maybe, you know, what names you think fit that bill? Yeah, sure. So there's been this great emergence of, of ETFs and funds that have figured out ways to generate enhanced income for investors in an ETF wrapper. Um, so we have some of them. They track S&P 500, NASDAQ, Russell, the most popular indices. And what you do is you enter into these different options strategies. The way we do it is we sell zero DTE, so zero day to expiry um, put options that are slightly in the money. And we so far have been on track to deliver enhanced income to the tune of the first distribution was about 62% on NASDAQ annualized. The second was 67% annualized. So those are 
you know, sizable enhanced income distributions. Um, there's some other products out there that do it by using covered call strategies. So if investors are willing to take the risk of an underlying index in order to, you know, potentially get that enhanced return through options selling, these are great ways to diversify your portfolio and get a little more bang for your buck. They're pretty new. A lot of people are like just coming to, you know, know about these funds. Right, and, and there's some concern about uh, zero DTE also and sort of its mm -hmm. effect on market structure, right? So how, what's your view on that? Yeah, so it's actually, you know, it's trading in in the trillions of AUM and um, the CBO actually recently put out a study. I think there was, uh, there was a day in June that was sort of like the hottest day for notional value traded in ODTE when everybody was sort of saying, you know, what will be the impact to the market and liquidity? And the gross exposure was less than a million dollars. So mm. the buyers and sellers actually more or less equaled out. Um, so there's really no, you know, again, it's, you're talking about just trillions of dollars of options. And now there are options on the actual ETF products themselves to boot. So, you know, thus far, it's almost like the levered inverse ETF argument. You know, everybody thinks the market moves in the last minute of the day because of those rebalances mm -hmm. and it's de minimis, so. And so, you know, another issue we, we talk a lot about on the show is just this increase in geopolitical risk. Um, Ukraine, Israel, Hamas. How are you as an investor thinking through that? Yeah, I think, you know, it's it's really interesting because markets have been almost impossible to predict because of these geopolitical events that come out of nowhere or just events that come out of nowhere. You know, last year it was Russia and Ukraine was the focus on, on everything and the whole market sort of turned and now we have Israel and Hamas. So we just think about, you know, in, ter in terms of the market had its reaction, I think, and and that lasted for a short period of time, and we're kind of back into November and on an upward trend. So there's always this risk of geo, you know, geopol geopolitics um, in terms of government spending, inflation, things like this, the price of oil going up. But so far, it looks like the oil, price of oil has now come down. Aerospace and defense stocks have gone up. Aerospace and defense spending will probably go up. So stocks to look at there could be your Boeing's, your Lockheed Martin's, you know, your your Raytheon types of plays. Um, but yeah, I think it's just always preparing for that volatility and having some sort of cash income product stuck mm -hmm. in your portfolio somewhere. Um, one final quick question on a, a product from a competitor, the mm -hmm. Meme ETF that mm -hmm. just announced it's liquidating, which raises the question of, because a big part of the ETF business these days seems to be looking for those like buzzy things. In this mm -hmm. case, it didn't work out. So how do you think about wanting to be part of that zeitgeist, but like then sometimes it goes away. <laughs> so I, you know, I think that a lot of ETF issuers, including ourselves, have had ideas that we thought were just phenomenal ideas, whether it's a meme stock or, um, you know, a particular trend that, that people are really embracing. And you, you often think about, you know, who's the next generation of investors? And it's, it's millennials, it's Gen Z, it's sort of beyond. And what are they going to be interested in? And it's often these types of things that attract that crowd. But then it comes back to the fact that, you know, you go through these tough markets periods, you get an August pullback, September pullback, October, you know, the Fed laying the hammer on interest rates. And you just don't want to touch those things. You kind of get back to keep it simple. And, you know, so I think that a lot of us, a lot of ETF issuers like ourselves and, you know, the, the company that closed the meme stock are probably leaning more in the direction of what's actually sustainable for longer periods of time. Um, I do think there was a time for that. And people were really excited about those trades. And the, the product was there to allow them to capture that investment theme. But unfortunately, it just didn't stick around. And at the end of the day, it comes down to if no one's trading it, you have to close it. Yeah, makes sense. <laughs> Sylvia, great to see you in great person. Great to see you Thanks too. So much Thank for you. And Sylvia Jablonski of Defiance ETFs. Thank you. Thanks. Well, coming up, General Motors' $10 billion accelerated share repurchase program will dig into the automaker's latest move to win back Wall Street's confidence.
Stocks on track for the best month of the year. Jared Blickery is here with a look at what's, what Wall Street's fear gauge, the VIX, of course, says about the direction for the broader market. Tell us, Jared. All right. Well, I'll show you in some charts. I'll get to the VIX in a second. First, I want to show you the S&P 500. We are right up against the highs of the year that we had just a few months ago in July. NASDAQ composite, very much a similar story, but almost double the return up, 36 percent. And not surprisingly, if we take a look at the VIX, the fear gauge, that is at the year's lows. In fact, these are the lowest points of the year. And you'd have to go back a long time, several years, to see a lower point. Um, here is the VIX index going all the way back to the early 90s when it began. And you can see we are in the oh, lower part of this range right here. And this is very beneficial for stocks. I overlaid, and this is going to be the S&P 500 going back about 40 years to 1986, so just a bit short of the four decades. Anytime the VIX has below 15, I have colored this cyan, and you can see these tend to be really bullish times for the stock market. Again, that's the S&P 500. These uh, cyan dots and lines come in when the VIX is under 15, and these are few and far between. There's a little one-off, but here's another big one. And then taking it to the current times, this is what we're looking at right now. So is this a one-off? Possibly, but you got to consider the context. Uh, this was a huge secular run, and while this was a 20 percent decline, it was really nothing in terms of the long-term trajectory of the S&P 500. Now, being, bringing it back to the present here, just wanted to show you that we have had, over the last couple of days, some of the narrowest participation, narrowest range in the S&P 500 in years. And this is a point in my morning brief tomorrow that Christmas perhaps is coming early. We were talking to Amanda Agati yesterday, and she believes the fact that we had a big turkey rally probably means that we're not going to get a big uh, rally at the end of the year, just because the Fed is the main wild card. The Fed is not expected to make any waves. Could be. Um, just want to close with this. For argument's sake, this is what the fear gauge, the VIX, tends to do every year. This is an average going back to 1990. This is that cyan line, and you can see it does indeed drop into the end of the year. And here's what's happened so far. So arguably, maybe we did pull forward some of that move. But nevertheless, do you want to short a boring market? That is something that Wall Street has been advised not to do for a long time. And Ryan Dietrich, who was here earlier today, was saying the very th same thing. Uh, be careful shorting a boring market. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Jared. Appreciate it. General Motors shares, they are soaring after announcing a massive $10 billion accelerated share buyback program as the company looks to win back confidence from Wall Street and investors. Our very own Brian Sazi sat down with General Motors CEO Mary Barra earlier and asked her why the company is making the move now. I personally am not happy with where the share price is. And I think, you know, when we look at what we've been through from a from COVID, from semiconductor shortages, and then from the uncertainty around the uh, UAW strike and the, the, you know, the labor situation more broadly, we are we have certainty now. And we always have had a capital allocation framework and our, our target cash um, was up on average around 18 to $20 uh, billion. And so when you look at that and you look at the cash that we had, we thought this was the right thing to do to return it to our owners. And joining us now is Wedbush Securities Managing Director, the one and only Dan Ives. Dan, thank you for joining, my friend. Great to be here. So, Dan, let me first just get your take on this news here. We've got revised guidance, big shareholder repurchase update. Stock is ripping higher. What, what did you make of the news? I mean, look, they've been through an F5 tornado. I mean, if you look at Bar and GM, and this finally, it's ripping the Band-Aid off. I mean, it's given some guidance. The buyback, I think, is important. And then when it comes to cruise and some of the, even from the electric vehicle perspective, maybe pulling back some of those goals. Look, the reality is UAW, that's sort of been albatross. That's done. This is almost what I put, putting the train back on the tracks. Well, Dan hates Julie, by the way. You know, putting the train back on the tracks, but you can't make invest or make customers want to buy the cars at the end of the day, particularly the EVs, or can you? Is the issue that people don't want them, or is the issue that GM is not making the right EVs? Well, Julie, the issue is really 2024 was going to be the year. I mean, that was the inflection point year that Mary and the team talked about for, for years. Now, obviously, UAW got in the middle of that. It, it's still TBD. I mean, you got to really see a year from now what the demand looks like. I believe 
Look, I mean, I've been to Detroit I mean, many times. I've seen what they're coming out with. I believe the next 12 to 18 months, like they have the vehicles. They have the distribution. It's now about conversion. That's really going to be the key for GM looking ahead, you know, especially ironically, you know, with you got Cybertruck tomorrow where it just shows Tesla, they're just doubling down when it comes to EVs. But you know, what's interesting, Dan, I just want your broader take on the EV market. I look at that market right now and it looks like consumer demand is wavering, Dan. I mean, I see companies, they're cutting prices, companies putting off billions in EV related investments. I mean, are you are you still confident, not just for GM, but when you look at the EV market, are you still confident that it's going to grow the way we would expect, that it's still a smart opportunity for investors? Yeah, look, John, I think if you look like China, okay, could that be the blueprint, Europe, US? Maybe it's more modest, right, in terms of what the growth rate looks like. But even if you look at 3%, Okay, let's say it doesn't go to 40% penetration. Let's say it goes to 20% in the next six, seven years. That's a few trillion of ultimately when you look at the actual opportunity. So that's significant. That's what the automakers are going after. That's what Tesla's going after, Rivian, and of course the 313 area code. So we continue to be very bullish on electric vehicles in terms of what's happening globally. I think it's just the start. Dan, you know we want to ask you about the Cybertruck, but I got one more question on GM. And we're, we just showed on the screen, you still have an outperform on the stock, but you don't sound like you have a lot of conviction in your voice when we talk to you about it, even if you've got that outperform. Look, I, my view is GM's a stock where there's no reason from evaluation and they're successful. It goes back to what I've used the mid 40s. So from evaluation, just given the opportunity, but being a GM bull, it's like being a Giants fan, right? It's been a very <laughs> difficult path the last year. <laughs> well said, Dan. I got to get you out of here on this. The Cybertruck, tomorrow Tesla has its long-awaited uh, delivery event for the Cybertruck, Dan. What do you expect to hear about pricing, and why do you think, Dan, Tesla investors should be excited about this vehicle? Because we know production is not going to be easy. Yeah, look, this is a historical day for Musk and Tesla, four years in the making. I think 60 to 80K, that's sort of the sweet spot for prices, probably closer to 60, 65K. But it's important because it's a category builder. And I think at scale, this could get to two, 250,000 units. You got 2 million reservations based on estimates. Even if it's 40% conversion, that's another 800,000. They're going after share from Ford, from GM, and others. But look, I, this is complex to produce. But Musk, Tesla have been there before. I think it's just going to be another trophy case moment in terms of what we see in terms of the unveiled Cybertruck. Dan, supposedly people are, some people are getting deliveries of these things tomorrow. Who is buying this Cybertruck? I cannot find. Now listen, I don't know everybody, right? I put out some calls on social media. I asked my good friend Dan Ives, who covers this company, do you know anyone, like a real human, who is buying one of these things, who's actually getting one of these things, I haven't been able to find them. I mean, there's not that many people overall, but like, you know, like who's getting, what's the audience? Who's buying them? Well, it's on the list, right? So knows who's going to be there tomorrow in Austin. Like you have a select list that's already, you know, been picked. They're clearly not going to talk. You know, they'll, they'll talk once they have the vehicle. But I think this is something that we're all going to see tomorrow in terms of those vehicles get delivered. And I think this is going to be an important month to, to see more of those cyber trucks on the line. That's why, Julie, I could look at I, a year from now. I mean, we could see Julie, you know, taking that cyber truck, you know, driving uh, in around New York City. She's not sold, Dan. I, I'm telling you, it's a tough sell. Yeah, I, tough sell. But I, yeah. I don't know. But I, but I am curious, like, what's the profile of, like, is it somebody who was driving a Humvee before? Is it somebody who's driving a Ford F-150 who's going to buy this instead? Like, who is this person? I, I think it's more halo effect, a, a core Tesla customer that has either an X that's had a three, a Y, and now looking to use that as more of a sport utility pickup. Mm -hmm. You know what, You know what, Dan, I think we do a Hives Lipton, an Ives Lipton uh, halvesies here. I'll split it with you. We're both in the tri-state area. We, we, can, we can share it. We, we, we'll do it. We could share. You could have it during the week and I could have it in the weekend. It's, that makes it, sense. It's, done. It's, it's a deal. Done. done. Dan Ives, great seeing you as always. Great seeing you. Thanks. And coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves, the top trending tickers. Stay tuned.
We're about a minute away from the close of trading. So where have we gone today? Not much of anywhere. <laughs> Down about tenth of one percent, but really dipping into the negative here just in the last few minutes of trading. But it's not like we were rallying big at any mm -hmm. point during the session, right, Josh, just down a little bit. But if you look at the sectors here today and the action that we're seeing, it looks like some of it is being driven by the bond action that we talked about earlier, the yield on the tenure dipping uh, below, below, four, three. below yeah. four three. So milestone here with real estate in the driver's seat in terms of what's gaining. Consumer staples here are actually utilities, just flipping up our utilities, consumer staples, energy, some of the weakest performers here. So interesting day on that front. And I like to look at the NASDAQ 100 as well. Oh, look at that big green NVIDIA in the middle of our screen there. Speaking at DealBook today, Jensen Wong, of course. Yep. Yes, speaking at a DealBook, but um, all of the other Magnificent Seven are in the red on the day. Meta down 2%, so uh, really the worst among them here. And there's the closing bell on Wall Street on this Wednesday. The Advertising Hall of Fame, look at that, right? <laughs> ringing the closing bell here today. Um, and as I mentioned, really seeing a little bit of a dip at the very end of the session today, although still relatively small move on the day overall with the Dow, higher by about 14 points, the S&P losing four and a quarter, about a tenth of 1%, and the NASDAQ down just 23 points. Not huge moves here uh, for the major averages. Um, but we did see some more movement on the sector level. We saw some more movement in tech in particular. We were just looking at, at the NASDAQ 100 and seeing some of that deterioration in the so-called Magnificent Seven over which there has been so much discussion this year about the reliance of the major averages on that group. And indeed, the NASDAQ could not manage a gain today without it. All right, now turning to some of today's trending tickers. Shares of Petco getting battered after the company posted an unexpected loss in the third quarter. So ticker here is woof, as we know, Julie, which seems appropriate given mm. the stock move today. It actually just absolutely crashed on that headline. It's down about some 70% now this year. So reported Q3 adjusted loss per share. That was worse than what the street expected. And the CEO talked about how the company is navigating, in his words, a challenging consumer environment. That's how yeah. he puts it. They're doing that by changing what they're carrying, it sounds like. They're going to be culling some brands that they carry that he says have not been uh, performing. Ron Coughlin, the CEO there, um, and saying that this should help our shelves be more productive. He said, he acknowledged the third quarter results were below our expectations and said that they're taking action. But investors are not uh, reassured by that action action that they're taking. Analysts like those over at Wells Fargo are saying that this represents another disappointing shortfall for the company and that the shares will remain, get this, in the doghouse. Nice touch. Yes. yes. They actually, they downgraded equal weight. They cut the target to three, just considering they say these discretionary headwinds. Yeah, definitely. Well, let's talk about Hormel Foods as well. Spam maker reporting a miss on the top and bottom line in its fourth quarter. And the company also reporting a lackluster fiscal year 2024 forecast. Hormel amongst the worst performing stocks in the S&P 500 today with that dip that we're seeing from the share from uh, in the shares. Excuse me. Analysts here also quite negative, saying the shares uh, the results missed from top to bottom. That was the result, or, or the commentary, I should say, uh, from Barclays uh, with this miss that we were getting from the from the company. Yeah, it's a rough day. Of course, the maker of you know Spam, Skippy, um, swing and miss on Q4 results, not what the street wanted to see. Shares were actually trading at the lowest since 2017 oh. today at one point. Um, commentary from execs on the consumer, again, kind of cautious. They talk about slowing consumer demand. It was also interesting to see what analysts were talking about, not just here, but internationally, how that's under pressure and weakness in China was specifically called out. Yeah. And, and finally, we want to look at GameStop again. We talked about it yesterday. We're talking about it today. That's because it's still trending on the Yahoo Finance platform. And it's up another 20%. There have been an increasing number of bets placed on a call option for the stock to hit $20 per share by December 8th. That's uh, just when the company reports earnings here. Uh, you know, as we talked a little bit about yesterday, with GameStop, it's hard to figure out exactly what is going on here, both on a sort of technical stock basis and also on a fundamental basis. The company has not given a lot of details for, you know, it's sort of notorious for having very short earnings calls, for example, where yep. they don't take any questions. 
So it's interesting and a little mysterious to see this move. Yeah, I mean, results are on tap next week. Um, Q3 results, that's what we're looking mm -hmm. for, for maybe some more information and insight there. Of course, longtime favorite of the Wall Street bets crowd, right? We all remember early 2021, yeah. uh, GameStop was all we were talking about, the great meme craze. Hard to see it making those kind of spikes again, but certainly on, on making headlines. Today. Yeah, definitely. And also seeing a lot of volume, 30 million shares, Trading hands today, at, one, at least by earlier today, 900% of the three-month average. So a lot yeah. of activity there. It was interesting. You mentioned that Bloomberg report, which, mm -hmm. you know, so the options About and the GameStop. Options, yeah, yeah. seeing just, just this wild volume. And traders betting, they say the stock's going to rally 50% a little over a week. And it looks like the appetite, they say, is coming from those individual retail investors. That's what's yeah, happening. It would have to be. All right. Moving on, while 2023 has been the year of outperformance by the Magnificent Seven, there are other market opportunities investors should keep an eye out for. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's Inez Ferre. Inez. Yeah, Josh, and if you weren't in the Magnificent Seven this year, you may have had sort of a muted performance in your portfolio. But I spoke to one portfolio manager who told me that he believes next year will be a year where you could see some broadening. So you could really pick some stocks within certain sectors. And he basically was pointing to two trends next year. One is that the market is has expected that the Fed is done uh, it, with the interest rates hikes. And in fact, you could even see interest rates cuts, according to some market analysts out there. So you, you are seeing a leveling out of those interest rates. And then for an, another trend that he sees is that destocking is over. So you had during 2021, 2022 companies uh, hoarding inventory, and then they've had to destock this year. So he believes that that trend is now over going into 2024. And so then you will have more of a normalization, sort of speak, uh, in, in some of these companies. So one of the areas that he believes is good is real estate. And this is why he says that real estate took the brunt of the interest rates hikes this year. And he believes that rental, this is uh, Aaron Dunn, who's co-head of value equity team at Eaton Vance, part of Morgan Stanley Investment Management. He's told me that uh, mortgage rates have really impacted the real estate market this year, but rental homes will be in demand going into 2024 as building costs go up and the cost to finance some of these buildings go up. So he's basically saying that you're going to see a demand for rental companies. And so Inv Invitation Homes, INVH, that's one of the stocks that he's looking at, which is up 12% year to date. Also, Mid America Communities is another stock, MAA. And then basic materials is another sector that he's also taking a look at for opportunities. When we talk about basic materials, these are companies that produce chemicals, everything from tin to timber. This is the stuff that goes into the products. And so he was saying that, look, you are the basic material companies are at the heart of the destocking trends. And so they have been destocking this year and going into 2024, you are going to see some opportunities there. He was recommending FMH, FMC, which is is a company, a developer of insecticides uh, and for agriculture use. And so uh, basic materials is where you may be seeing some stock picks. Also, healthcare. XLV is down 4% this year, but he's saying, look, funding took a hit this year because of the high interest rate environment. And going into 2024, some of the companies that do more of the picks and shovel stocks, those are the ones that build out equipment for capacity uh, for companies for pharmaceutical companies, Thermo Fisher, which is down 10%. They provide everything from medical equipment to software and analytical tools. That's one company to take a look at within that sector. And then the semiconductor, that has also been at the heart of the destocking a trend that we have seen this year. So it's looking at semiconductors going into next year, especially the second half of next year, if we get a little bit of a sluggishness at the first half of the year, Texas Instruments is one of the companies that this portfolio management manager is looking at. Texas Instruments is down 6% year to date. Guys? And yes, Ferrey, thank you. Thank you. All right, let's talk Salesforce third quarter results just hitting the wire. Earnings per share coming in ahead of estimates. Revenue in the third quarter up about 11% pretty much in line with estimates. So the real headline here, I think, is the outlook. The company raising its full year earnings per share forecast, now looking at 8.18 to 8.19 a share 
for the full year. It saw, had seen 804 to 806. So again, coming in better than estimated on the sales force. And Mark Benioff, of course, the chair and CEO of the company, um, talked about that the company is now the third largest enterprise software company by revenue. And he says the number one AI uh, CRM, customer relationship manager. He says the number one enterprise apps company as well. And so he says that they are well positioned right now. And we are seeing the shares gain in the after hour session. I'm quickly going to run through the Snowflake numbers and then let's talk about both for a moment, Josh. So Snowflake also out as we're focusing on services for the enterprise. Uh, Snowflake here, uh, third quarter adjusted uh, share beat adjusted earnings per share, excuse me, beating estimates here, 25 cents versus the 16 cent estimate and the company also raising its forecast. So when you look collectively here at the sort of enterprise spending environment, a couple more, you know, on the heels of some others that we've gotten, a couple more indications that things are looking pretty good. Yeah, Salesforce is particularly impressive because remember this stock has had a tremendous 2023. It ran into this print already up 70% this year and now tacking on nice gains in the after hours too. I'm gonna to be very interested to hear what Mark Benioff has to say on the call about the macro environment, about demand, what he's seeing in his business in terms of, of deals and renewals. You know, really, you know, the central question for investors with this name was, was Benioff gonna be able to really keep delivering strong double digit top line growth while also delivering that kind of higher, you know, it's called 30% plus margins in the quarters ahead. And at least initially here in the after hours, it looks like he's giving investors confidence there. Yeah, and remember, of course, uh, Salesforce is also under some activist yep. pressure, right? And so we'll see if he gets any questions about that on the call, about what he's hearing, the discussions he's engaging with, any other changes uh, that he might be continuing to make at the company in response uh, to that activist pressure. But thus far, uh, things looking pretty good there on the, the Salesforce line, um, and so and the stock performing well as, uh, as well. And then when it comes to Snowflake also, uh, the company talking about product revenue growing 34% year over year. Uh, that's one of the things that they were highlighting here. Overall revenue for the quarter was up by 32%. So still seeing from these big companies, some pretty impressive growth in terms of that double digit revenue growth in both of these cases. Yeah, Snowflake will be another very interesting call. I mean, I, I will point out, you know, some analysts who, who cover the name were saying, listen, they, they did have, you know, some easier comps for Q3 and Q4. So those are some tail ones. They'll note the expectation on, this, on, the, on the street heading into the print were relatively muted. Um, and remember that the bogey the company has put out there, that they, you know, 10 billion in product revenue by calendar 28. So, and I know some, some, at least some on the street think that that could be a challenge. So mm -hmm. it's another certainly issue. It'll be interesting how they talk about that on the call. Yeah, definitely. When, when you talk about that in the quarter, I mentioned the product revenue of 34%, 698 million is where they are. The number you're talking about is yeah. annual, but still gives a little bit of perspective. And even though I mentioned it's impressive to see that uh, double digit growth, it's a lot smaller than the growth that they were seeing, right? So sure. that's something to put it in perspective as well. All right. Well, coming up, we're going to dig into Salesforce's Q3 earnings report. A lot more It's coming up after the break.
Salesforce beating estimates on the top and bottom line, and the company also lifting its full year forecast. Here for a closer look at the latest Salesforce results, we've got Nancy Pryle, Essex Investment Management Co-CEO and Senior Portfolio Manager. Nancy, thanks for being here. So for you, what is sort of fueling this latest phase of growth for Salesforce? Well, we think it's a combination of on the top line, continued progress with expanding their suite of customer relationship management products. Um, they've also seen, they've taken some price increases, which are coming through and helping out with revenue. And then we've got the very beginnings of their entry into really using AI technology and using generative AI to allow their customers to really monetize and get a lot more value out of all of the data that's embedded in their CRM system. So we think that um, is going to provide a pathway not only for this kind of 10, 11 percent top line growth, but potentially higher top line growth going forward. And so that's, I think you're answering my question here because the central question for investors, it seems here to me, Nancy, was, you know, was Mark Benioff going to be able to keep delivering that very strong double digit top line growth, but also keep delivering Nancy's higher, let's call it 30 percent margins. Are you confident that he can keep that momentum going, not just, you know, for the Q4, but in the quarters ahead? We are. Um, we're particularly confident on the operating margin. As I'm sure you know, Salesforce, for a company of their scale, and as I said, I think they're the third largest enterprise software company now, their margins really are not as high as many of their competitors. So there's still some low-hanging fruit, if you will, that they have um, integrating some of their previous acquisitions. And we think the combination of Mark Benioff recognizing that this is what the market wants, as well as having an activist presence on the board um, will allow them to keep moving these margins, not, not only maintaining them in this 30, 31% range, but actually potentially moving them up into something more in the mid 30% range, combined with the ability to keep a good, strong top line growth rate. How much is AI a part of that equation? Not just that it's something that you know they think customers want, but that it's also going to help on the margin side. Well, we don't know yet exactly how it will play out on the margin side. We do think that having a good AI solution to allow their customers to really maximize the value of all of the data that they have entered into their CRMs is not only important to drive future growth, but in some sense is actually in the long run going to be necessary as a tool to be able to um, compete effectively in this space. Um, we think it will be a very good productivity tool for their customers. And so their customers will see some good productivity increases from using AI. In the short run, there is going to be more development involved with driving this AI, but we don't think that will detract from the margin story. We think they'll be able to still grow margins even with that. And Nancy, let's talk about competition as well, because I mean, certainly Salesforce has it. You think of uh, Microsoft Dynamics 365. How do you think about that competition, Nancy, that rivalry? Or do you think, listen, the, 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 mar the CRM market's big enough, it can have two players? We absolutely think it's big enough to have two players. And in fact, we, we fully expect that there will continue to be new, smaller players that crop up, that try to take one piece of the marketplace or another. Having a strong customer base, being the brand name in the CRM business, um, and then continuing to layer in more technologies to use the technologies to drive those ultimate um, resources for their customers is what will keep them competitive. And so far, Salesforce has not shown any inability to compete effectively. And Nancy, I am curious in a bigger picture way as well. We were just talking about what some of these um, numbers show in terms of enterprise willingness to spend, right? There was a lot of concern about that, I think, yeah. um, because of the, con the rhetoric we're hearing about these CEOs saying they're concerned about the economy, but they do seem to be spending from what we can see, at least to some degree. Well, that's right. We are seeing a lot of cross currents in the economy overall. And one of those certainly has to do with CEOs sounding more concerned about spending, but they need to spend to drive productivity. The way to cope with the increased wages that all of these companies need to pay is to drive employee productivity. Productivity tools like software, as well as using the cloud, are really the only way to get over that so that they continue to improve their margins. So I think we saw a pause in spending 
post um, the demise of Silicon Valley Bank in the spring. And now people have had a chance to reflect, to see that the economy is still strong, consumer spending is still strong, employment is still strong. And so it's not gangbusters, certainly, but the environment has improved and we are seeing some good steady growth out of a number of players in the business. And what about, um, Nancy, M&A right now? You know, Benioff's been talking about M&A. Some think they listen to him talk about M&A. They think maybe it's back on the table. Um, would you be positive about him pulling the trigger on making another acquisition? Are there holes in his portfolio where you think that could make sense? Or would you, would you rather him not? Well, I would say today we would rather not see a big acquisition until they get their margins a little higher, until we see them really harness the power of the acquisitions they've made, and to really focus on building out, again, this generative AI capability within their software. If there were some small software tuck-ins that could get them the technology they need or get them the technologists that they need, that would be different, but we hope they don't make a, another very large acquisition in the near term. All right, Nancy Pryor, thank you so much for joining us today, Nancy. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And coming up, Google will start to deactivate accounts that haven't been used in a while. We're going to tell you how to protect your account. That's coming up next.
Google doing a little housekeeping, having a clean out of inactive accounts on its network. Already some warning emails have gone out to owners of quiet accounts. They'll be deleted come December 1st. Dan Halley here to tell us how to keep a, an account and the data within it. What is a, first of all, how do you define a quiet account? For how long does it have to have been quiet? Two years. So you oh, gotta okay. be, That's yeah, you gotta, you gotta be really sitting on that thing. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think the, the, the big thing that Google's trying to get across here is, they want to sunset, we'll say that in a nice way, these accounts, just delete them, get rid of them, trash them, because of security. They say that mm. these accounts that are generally left unattended for two years or more, people don't really have two-factor authentication on them, so they're more likely to be broken into and then used for things like, they specifically say, identity theft mm. uh, and other criminal acts uh, online. So there's a few ways, though, if you do have an account, I'll throw this out there, I made an account, a second account, because I wanted to make a Wendy's account to get some free Frosties. I was just making accounts over and over again. Some of those are gonna get the kibosh. Uh, <laughs> if you do wanna save them, I don't care about those did accounts. You get, did you get any free Frosties? I got some free Frosties. Also, someone's been trying to break into my Wendy's account. I don't know what's going on, but I keep <laughs> yeah. getting emails about it. Uh, so the, the way that you would save your account, if you wanna hold on to it, the main thing is you would sign in, and then you could just go into Gmail, read an email, uh, send an email, anything along those lines will send Google a signal that you are in fact continuing to use that account. You don't have to necessarily do that though. If you already have a Google account, you can sign into the one that you wanna save and then just go watch something on YouTube. Anything, white noise, the original video where you see uh, an elephant at the zoo, uh, that's how you can save your account. Uh, there's a third way as well. If you have Google Drive, you can jump in there, create a nonsense document, upload, download something, again, that's a signal. Uh, and finally, you can go into Google Play uh, if you have an Android phone and download something from there, even browse the, the Play Store. And that's all going to send Google a signal to say, look, don't delete this app, uh, th this, this account, keep it on there. Now, if you do just wanna get rid of an old account, there are ways to hold onto your data because we use a lot of data in Google. And so the way to do that is to use Google's takeout feature. Uh, if you sign in, you can go to account manage, uh, uh, data management, and there's a takeout feature where you can just straight up export everything to your own computer. And then you can bring that to whatever app you want. It's something that uh, a lot of people want to do if they want to ditch an ecosystem. But if you're getting rid of an older account, you might as well just do this. It'll get your photos, your browsing history, uh, anything from Google Docs. If you want to get rid of all that though, you can just straight up delete your account right, right away. Or just let it ride off into the sunset. All right, Dan Halley, smart tricks of the trade there. Mm. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the commercial real estate industry battered in a post-pandemic world, but our next guest says there are pockets of opportunity within the sector. Joining us now is Brian Klinksick, LaSalle Asset Management, Global Head of Research and Strategy. Brian, thank you for joining us. Josh, thanks for having me today. Maybe if I just start, I'm actually just interested to get your kind of 30,000 foot view. We're wrapping up this year, we're heading into 2024. What's kind of your, your general take on the real estate sector? Because I know you think just at a high level, it's still unsettled. Yeah, real estate is still adjusting to the big increase in interest rates that we have seen in most global markets. Interest rates, uh, we've seen a lot of volatility, but the, the, the degree of tr change in the last 18 months is just huge. And it takes time for that impact to translate into the market because the you know, on the ground mechanisms that happen is you know refinancings and all of the issues with uh, capital stacks that have been sort of turned upside down a little bit by lower uh, uh, levels of value, sticky expectations of sale prices by uh, owners of assets. So that process is still continuing and the market is still in a phase of price discovery. But a more stable rates environment, which seems to be in the offing, uh, will, be, will help resolve that and will lead to a return of transaction activity in real estate, um, but at a rebased level. And, and so that's what we're expecting in the new year. Now, predicting interest rates is notoriously difficult. And so one of the key things that, that LaSalle is focused on and my team on the research and strategy side is focused on is finding value within real estate. Because fundamentally, you know, if interest rates were easy to predict, we'd be making money you know, buying and selling bonds and derivatives based on those. And, and within real estate, the opportunity that we see has to do with sectors around uh, rental housing, around logistics, being a lender into real estate because debt uh, lending is the, the part of the market that reprices the fastest. 
And so those are some of the pockets that we're focused on. So what we have seen, you know, we talk more about the residential market, meaning like people buying and selling homes. And there, of course, we have seen a freeze because people have locked in lower interest rates. Is some of that phenomenon happening on the commercial side as well? And so is that why maybe some stability in rates will help unfreeze some of it? I do want to get into the sectors, but I'm curious about this. Well, the U.S. is very special in a global context from a residential perspective because we have 30-year fixed rate mortgages in the U.S. I actually live in the U.K., and you can't fix a, a, a mortgage rate for anywhere near that length of time. Mm. And so the U.S. Is, has this unique characteristic, and that has made people sticky to their homes, which has actually put a floor under home prices and pushed some people into the rental market. We continue to see really strong demand in the rental market, which is where we're focused. We're investors in income producing real estate. And, and, and the commercial side, it's a little bit more like residential mortgages in the rest of the world, where they reset more frequently. Mm. And so in the next, you know, right now and in the next sort of couple of years, all of those resets and, and the, the maturity of those loans are going to have to be dealt with. And they're going to have to be dealt with uh, in the context of property values that are lower than they have been. And Brian, coming back to commercial real estate, when we look at a lot of American cities, downtowns, they still don't feel surely like as, as filled as they used to be, right? What, what do you think the fix is there? Well, I, I think the, the fix has to do around live, work, and play and having a mix of activities in city centers. I, I think I, I mentioned that I live in the UK, I live in London. And in London, you see very different situations in different parts of the city. So Canary Wharf, which is a district of high-rise office towers, and there's not a whole lot to do other than go to the office, looks a lot like a lot of American downtowns, maybe like the financial district here in New York. And they've had a much weaker return to the office there. But in the West End, where my office is, there's, you know, go out to dinner, go out to a show. It's a little more like midtown Manhattan, where, you know, I was earlier today, and the vibrancy there is palpable. And so the long run has to be creating a mix of activities and uses that draw people in. The, the phrase that I use is commute-worthy experience. Is, it, is the, 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 the being in that place worth the effort and the cost and the time and the money and the pain of riding the subway or being stuck in traffic to get there? And I think a lot of American downtowns don't yet deliver that commute-worthy experience. So getting back to the sectors here, and on a, a related note, you guys like rental housing, I believe you said. So, so you, that, does that imply that you still think the residential purchase market is going to remain a little bit frozen in the U.S. and people are, there's still going to be strong demand for rental housing? Yeah, I mean, one of the great characteristics of the U.S. economy is mobility. People will move for jobs. And uh, in this kind of tight labor market, uh, people still need to move, but the to buy housing is difficult. There's just nothing on the market because people have these long mortgages, you know, long 30-year uh, mortgages with low rates and they want to stay in them. And so that's pushing people into rental housing. Uh, the the pre fact that prices in, in for sale ho housing haven't adjusted much con continues the, you know, affordability issue mm -hmm. with becoming a home homeowner. That pushes people into rental housing. One of the subsectors of rental housing we really like is single family for rent. Mm. Because just because you are a renter doesn't mean that you shouldn't have to, you know, not be able to consider a house with a backyard and a place to, you know, hang out with your kids. So sort of disconnecting rental versus ownership with the type of housing you want. Not everybody wants to live in an apartment or can live in an apartment with their family situation, which is which is why we like that subsector as mm. well. And Brian, I want to get you out of this. You know, COP28, the, the global climate summit in Dubai that kicks off tomorrow. When you think about climate change, how does that sort of just shape, influence, and impact your thinking about real estate and real estate opportunities? Yeah, I'd break it down into mitigation and adaptation. So on the mitigation side, that means reducing uh, climate change. That is, uh, uh, you know, some of the markets where we invest, pretty much all of Europe, uh, Canada, Australia, some parts of the U.S., there is a absolutely strict regulatory expectation that we will decarbonize real estate, that the commercial real estate sector will decarbonize. Um, tenants are starting to expect it. So aside from needing to, to decarbonize because 
many people think it's the right thing to do. We have a fiduciary duty, duty to our clients to produce real estate that can hold up in the regulatory environment and the demand environment. So that is how real estate is aligning on the mitigation side. Now, adaptation is that the world is changing and that uh, we're getting stronger storms and sea levels are rising and making sure that we're targeting investments in locations that are resilient to climate change, where infrastructure is being built that, that can uh, make it future, more future-proofed, um, and, and you know, figuring out what investments we need to make into our properties to make them resilient to storms. So moving you know, critical equipment from the basement to a higher level in case that space floods so that we can get back online for our, our occupiers, for our tenant base, in short order after, after some kind of uh, emergency. Really interesting stuff. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Brian Klingsick, thanks right, for thank coming you. in. Josh and Julie, thank you so thanks. much for having me. Thank you. Care. All right, coming up, Music Lovers Uncovered. Spotify releasing its annual wrapped lists for its listeners. We're going to dig into it on the other side of the break. Good morning. This is Yahoo Finance. Big news. Three things that you need to know. We just got the announcement. What happens now? now? I got a question. What does success look like? What was one of the biggest challenges that you faced? How much does that raise the odds for a recession? This phase is over. Tell me what happens to the debt ceiling. Where does generative AI, though, fit into your portfolio? Talk to us about this diversification and what investors need to know. And I think it's important. This is the stuff that gets me out of bed, fired up. What's the gateway? What's the new bridge to opportunity? Doesn't matter if it's a soft landing or a hard landing. Landing. Big, big interview. I, I can't wait. Supreme Court out with a ruling on President Biden's student debt cancellation. Right, let's turn now to some recent tech earnings. And they give you information if you watch them closely. President Vosick, President Mester Gary Gensler, thank you so much. Part of what Davos is about is sharing best practices, coming forward with ideas, and then enabling those ideas into action. And I would add that there's more to come on this. And we keep producing products that help people lead healthier lives. This is one of those rooms they use to simulate light in space. Interest rates will come down again. Figure out where your money is going. 
now. You gotta scope that out. And the numbers really tell the story. What does all this mean for you? Keep it tuned into Yahoo Finance. Welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. I'm Dan Howley with Alexandra Canal and Josh Schaefer. We are kicking things off with a huge move in the gaming industry. GTA is coming to Netflix. GTA, Grand Theft Auto. Mm -hmm. I remember playing this, I was saying before we were discussing this, uh, listening to Limp Biscuit. Uh, <laughs> this is like two months ago. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, this is when I was younger in high school, the original Grand Theft Auto 3. Uh, it's coming to Netflix, you'll be able to get it through the Play Store, the uh, App Store, uh, or through Netflix on mobile. Uh, you're gonna get the original Grand Theft Auto 3, you're gonna get Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, you're gonna get Grand Theft Auto uh, Vice City. I can't remember the name of the actor still who does the, the voice in Vice City, but uh, either way, uh, Tears for Fears all over that uh, soundtrack for Vice City. And you know, this is a, a massive move for Netflix this franchise is virtually unstoppable. Grand Theft Auto V came out, I wanna say 2013, 2014, something mm. around there. It's still making bank for Take-Two Interactive. That's a parent company of Rockstar Games, which puts out Grand Theft Auto. Uh, they have now Grand Theft Auto Online, printing millions of dollars for them nonstop. You just get on there, they release an update and people just won't stop. This is huge news because they're fighting Microsoft, they're fighting Sony now, they're fighting not so much Nintendo, they're not really, you know, Nintendo does their own kind of thing, but the fact that they're getting into this gaming space so deeply now with such a huge franchise means that they're gonna be up against some tough competition. Well, to me, I mean, you just, like you said, Dan, you go out and get that big of a brand, feels like such a win when you're trying to build mm -hmm. sort of a new arm yeah. to your business. We talk about this a lot with the streamers, even what movies they have, right? And sort of what kind of content you get. You want to go out and basically get a top dog. Grand Theft Auto is easily that. Ali, I'm curious from the Netflix perspective, yeah. Does this actually help them get more subscriber? Like, what, what's the play for Netflix here and sort of the strategy, you think, of what they've said about they gaming? They say that it will. I mean, they have yeah. 80 games right now and counting. This obviously adds to it. And they say it's a huge entertainment opportunity. Greg Peters, a co-CEO, he talked about it at length on the last earnings call. He said that it's something that they can leverage in order to drive their core business. And it's a way to do this at scale, especially mm -hmm. if you attract those hardcore gamers. Hallie, I know you're one of them <laughs> with yeah. those big recognizable brands and names and different and, and it, I mean like you said if you're able to get a, a game as big as Grand Theft Auto mm -hmm. I think that's a great start when you're trying to differentiate yourself in the streaming wars and also trying to lure as many subscribers as possible Just playing Grand Theft Auto on the toilet at work don't tell anyone <laughs> it's, it's gonna be hard to play on your phone though right yeah I mean it's not like the best experience to get one of those like backbone things that like puts the controllers on the side okay. and then you can really start you know driving tanks down the middle of the streets or whatever you want to do. Yeah. Right, this is only available on mobile right now, and we'll see if they have plans to maybe do it on desktop. Yeah, right I now mean, it's solely mobile. Yeah, it's and the mobile market, you know, the the 800 pound gorilla in the room in the mobile market was Activision Blizzard, because they have mm. King, which has Candy Crush. Microsoft has Candy Crush yeah. now. Right. So it's, you know, anytime you get on a train in, in New York, you'll see someone riding and just crushing candy left and right. So the fact that Netflix is kind of trying to get into that space and now has that competition as well, I mean, you gotta think they're, they put a lot of thought into this to go with such a big franchise as Grand Theft Auto. I, uh, you know, I haven't played it in a little bit, but maybe I'll jump back on. Right. Well, I think yeah. we should all get it on our phones. We need the review. Yeah, and then we we're going to go to the Cybertruck launch tomorrow, okay, and we'll amazing. play GTA <laughs> in the Cybertruck, right? Yeah. That's the other story I want to get to here, the Tesla Cybertruck in the news today, ahead of that launch tomorrow, after it was ranked number one among Gen Z shoppers in a new survey by Autolist. So that was Gen Z ranking the Cybertruck number one. But when you strip out Gen Z and include everyone else, it was actually the Toyota Tacoma EV that grabbed the top spot. So there's your list right there from everyone. You see Toyota Tacoma EV, then the Ford F-150 Lightning, the Cybertruck actually coming in fourth. But Gen Z, which I will often admit, is my generation. Mm -hmm. Liking the Cybertruck, not totally shocked by that. I feel like people just think it's Think it's cool to some extent. I can see Dan's face. Dan's I out. I hate it so much. It's the but ugliest it's thing I've ever. It's, it's not even bulletproof. Dan, proof. come it's on. Like it's arrow it's, proof. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a, a whole bunch of people going around with uh, arrows that are going to be trying to take me out on the highway. Yeah. I, mean, I just think it, it looks like an ugly tin can. First of all, I don't like Teslas because the build quality is 
right? Yeah. I've, I've ridden in them as Ubers. I, I've rather, I'd rather sit on plywood than I would rather sit on yeah. those seats. Mm. I think the, the Mustang Mach-E is a great example of what EVs can be. Uh, I think the, the F-150 uh, Lightning uh, on there uh, is, is great. I just don't see the appeal of something that looks like what a six-year-old thinks a pickup truck looks like. Yeah, and look, like we talked a lot, especially on this dark, uh, group chat edition that we've had, that the EV demand has really slowed over the years, and that's due to mm. a variety of factors. But uh, I think what is interesting with the Cybertruck is that a lot of analysts have said it could create this halo effect for Tesla. So you can go and maybe have more consumers with the Cybertruck top of mind in headlines going and buying the Model S and mm, the Model Y right, yeah. and some of those other types of, of cars. So I'm curious to see how this Cybertruck uh, invigorates Tesla yeah. because they've been in a period of up and down. It well, I, th like. I think the thing I'm most excited about tomorrow and just looking forward is the truck actually coming out, and Dan knows this from all the tech stuff you cover, just getting it in normal people's hands yeah. and being able to go online and see what people say about it. Yeah. You know, yeah. I want to watch some YouTube review of some guy actually trying to put another arrow into the side of the truck for fun, <laughs> but then driving it, right? And what's it look like on the inside from a normal consumer and people being able to use the truck? We've been talking about this thing for years. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's I'm been excited delays. excited to just see normal and, people yes. own it and mm -hmm. hear what they say about it okay. as a car. As a car. As you a know, car. It's a good car. Yeah, well, people are certainly going to be saying a lot about the Cybertruck, and they are saying a lot, too, about what they're listening on Spotify, because we have Spotify wrapped officially being released. This is something that people really look forward to every single year. We had to go across the newsroom and see specifically what us three listened to the most. And I have to caveat this by saying, I was sharing an account with my brother. I recently got a new one. <laughs> so this only encompasses the past few months, although I think it is pretty accurate, because my number one artist on Spotify is my man, John Mayer. I just I just listen to him quite often. And then you two, very different vibes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> With uh, Zach Bryan, Every Time I Die. Yeah. Holly, I've never even listened to this band. I, so I like have to go screaming and music a lot. It's yeah. just, you know, uh, post punk. I don't there's so many different subgenres of like rock. I'll just say it's like a metal-ish yeah. band with guitars and a guy that screams a lot. And uh, it's fun. Okay, and and I am surprised none of us had the number one global artist, which was of course Taylor Swift. Uh, Swizzle, globally, yeah. yeah, that was like the least surprising. The least thing surprising of the Spotify thing ever. Rock, right? Flowers though by Miley Cyrus, yeah. the number one song that surprised me a Whoa. little bit. And then Bad Bunny with the number one global album. But you know, this is something that Spotify just has the edge on. There have been people that have actually canceled their plans for Apple Music or YouTube Music because they have the FOMO of not yeah. getting a Spotify This rap. is like the one week discussion, right? Where yeah. one of your <laughs> friends today is like, oh, I wish I had Spotify. And then like, I feel like it goes away after weeks. It's like, you gotta do it today or tomorrow mm -hmm. and make that switch. Otherwise, like if you have Apple Music and you're happy with it, I don't think Spotify wrapped is what moves you over. Right? Not for me, but people do, they're obsessed with, themselves. That's that's my take about all this. People what? people want to know like what this says about you as a what person. What town did you guys get? Where I'm at Cambridge, from? Massachusetts. I'm Buffalo, New York. Oh. Bozeman. Bozeman, Montana. I can't. Montana. I gotta go. I'm gonna bring my Zach Bryan oh music to Bozeman, God. Montana, and go I, hang out. I, I, Yellowstone I, uh, it up. I got nothing. I'm right. <laughs> Buffalo. Well, maybe Buffalo. maybe I gotta <laughs> shit myself. Wins. Ship myself up to New England, given my taste in music. But coming up, we have what you need to watch tomorrow. We break down the stories that you need to know to start your day. We'll be right back.
Disney making changes to its board. The entertainment giant announcing outgoing Morgan Stanley CEO James Gorman and Sir Jeremy Derrick, a veteran media executive and former group chief executive of Sky, will be joining the board of directors early next year. Francis D'Souza, former Illumina CEO, decided he will not seek re-election to the board. Let's talk a little change here in after hours. So uh, with Gorman, obviously, we have a, a statement here from Gorman saying that Disney stands apart both in its creative excellence and its deep connection with consumers. Consumers, of course, big name, Julia, tested executive, led Morgan Stanley for, for many years, credited with sort of transforming, mm -hmm. of course, Morgan Stanley from uh, financial crisis into really just a wealth management powerhouse, which, of course, investors always appreciate. Um, and just, listen, very strong reputation in the financial services industry. I also thought some of these headlines Iger was making, by the way, and, and he was speaking at this New York Times Dealbook conference today, sounds like a wide-ranging interview. And a couple of the key points here, one is he says he would definitely, uh, his words, step down when his current contract ends in 2026. Of course, he uh, returned to Disney last year, mm -hmm. um, less than a year after he retired, after the board ousted his his hand-picked guy, right, Bob mm -hmm. Chapik. So again, I guess we're talking succession. We'll see who he who he perhaps handpicks this time. The other big headline there too was saying that ABC um, is in fact not for sale, which is interesting. Um, we remember him kind of talking about ABC, maybe suggesting that it was not core to Disney's business. Mm -hmm. Obviously, um, you know, ABC like so many other linear channels under some pressure. But it sounds like, in fact, he's saying it will not be for sale. Yeah, I mean, he's definitely had some sort of back and forth on some of this commentary over where strategy is going to go. So it's interesting that now he has a media veteran on the board as well as a financial world veteran on the board. For James Gorman, you know, he needs he needs something to do, right? <laughs> after he steps down from Morgan Stanley and after Ted Pick takes over as the new CEO. So um, interesting. You gotta fill out your time somehow. Yeah, you know? sure. Yeah. Why not do it with a nice little board position? Um, but seriously, um, it, it is interesting here and we'll see um, if this satisfies Nelson Peltz, for example, over Tryon, who question. wants uh, some yep. changes to happen at Disney. And the board size, by the way, will temporarily increase to 13 because Francis D'Souza not uh, re-upping, but they're adding two. So yep. we'll see how long that lasts. I uh, want to take a look at some of the trending after our tickers right now. A couple of companies coming out with earnings. We start with PVH, uh, the maker of Tommy Hilfiger and Calvin Klein uh, Apparel. Uh, the company now cutting its full year revenue forecast. It says now revenue will increase just 1% for its full year fiscal 2024. It had seen a 3 to 4% increase here. Uh, this is after third quarter results did come in ahead of estimates from an earnings per share perspective. Revenue uh, did miss estimates, it looks like. Um, and so that perhaps was responsible for the shortfall in the, the full year as well. Um, but the company trying to have some more discipline on cost as well, it looks like. And then in terms of some of the other movers that we're watching here, we got Victoria's Secret as well. Uh, that company reported on sales that fell year over year. They came out in line with estimates here. And the company's forecast for the fourth quarter pretty much in line with estimates, as is the forecast for the full year. So looking at Victoria's Secret, they have been doing quite a bit of revamping here. And the company's CEO, uh, Martin Waters does say that they are excited with early holiday sales trends in November. November sales and margins, he said, are best monthly results in nearly two years, but the shares giving up some of their early gains. And then finally, quick check on Synopsys, which um, helps provide infrastructure and design for semiconductor companies. Uh, that company coming out with uh, adjusted earnings per share for the first quarter, a forecast that was ahead of what analysts had been looking for. Fourth quarter numbers also ahead of the average analyst estimate here. Uh, the company looking for continued double digit revenue growth in the year ahead. So that's something to uh, continue to watch as sort of uh, with the chip ecosystem, if you will. Synapse is a very important part of that. And we're going to be speaking to the incoming CEO of Synopsis tomorrow. That's Sassine Ghazi. He takes over from the longtime CEO on uh, January 1st. And time now for what to watch Thursday. More earnings on deck. Ulta reporting after the bell. We'll get insight on if the cosmetics industry can weather a tougher economic environment and lower discretionary spending. We're also going to get a pulse on the PC market as Dell also reporting earnings after the bell. 
And moving to the housing market, expect a new read on mortgage rates. We're going to see if the decline continues after dropping for four straight consecutive weeks. And shifting gears to Tesla, the EV maker Cybertruck event kicks off in Austin, Texas to celebrate the first deliveries of this next generation vehicle. A couple more important events to watch out for the first day of COP28 and the OPEC Plus meeting taking place on Thursday. The two-week COP28 summit will kick off, bringing together world leaders to address the current climate crisis, while the OPEC Plus meeting will give insight on future oil production policy. Steps lastly on the economic front, core PCE data, the Fed's preferred inflation gauge being released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The index is forecast to rise 3.5% year over year, a decline from September's 3.7% rise. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. That was a lot of stuff that's coming up, man. <laughs> Woo. Get ready. Yeah, I'll be ready. Well, be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good night.